I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to Special Edition. If there is anger abroad in the body top politic, sometimes it seems as though the local city council is where the anger hits hardest. Why would someone run for a city council seat? We're going to spend an hour with some of the city council members just elected to office and talk to them about why they ran, what they heard from the public, and what they've already learned in the few short months they've been in office. Thank you all for joining me. We are joined by um, Emily Beach from the Burlingame City Council. Emily's a former captain in the United States Army and was president of the Burlingame Community for F Education Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Next, we have Sam Hindi. Sam from the Foster City City Council. Sam owns a local business and was on the City Parks and Rec Commission. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, next, Marty Medina. Marty is, was a construction inspector for the city of San Bruno and now is a San Bruno property owner. Thank you for joining us, Marty. Diane Pappin is from the San Mateo City Council. Diane is an attorney in private practice and was president of the Baywood Neighborhood Association and vice president of the San Mateo United Homeowners. Couldn't quite stage the coup, I suppose. <laughs> Doug Kim is here from Belmont City Council. Doug was on the Belmont Planning Commission prior to running for the council. In full disclosure, Doug and I are colleagues at Sam Trans, where he's director of planning, despite my best efforts. And then Shelly Mazur from the Redwood City City Council, nonprofit CEO. Shelly was on the school board before running for council. Welcome, all of you. Emily, I'll start with you. Why, why run for council? That's Especially good. given the context of the times we're in. These are not jobs that necessarily carry with them a lot of reward for the amount of effort you have to put into them. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I think all of us, I think the common factor is that we love our cities and uh, we value, you know, we enjoy public service and that not, that's not for everybody, but um, it certainly works for people who are passionate about it. But I think specifically in Burlingame, it's, a, it's an exciting time right now. There's, there's a lot going on. We're enjoying a strong economy like many cities throughout the peninsula, um, but that brings its own complex challenges too. And those challenges are, need to be worked through. Um, Burlingame specifically, we're undergoing a revision of our general plan for the first time since the late 1960s. So it's a magnificent opportunity to look at our, over the next two years or so, we're going to be looking at our zoning, our residential, our business zoning. We're reimagining our bayfront in a new way. And the decisions that are, will be made in the next few years are going to impact not just the next five to 10 years, but the next 20 to 50 in Burlingame. And it's a magnificent opportunity to to make a big impact on, on my community. So that's why I ran. Thank you, Sam, why'd you run? Well, it's not much difference really, but it's uh, the passion for the city. I've been living in Foster City for 24 years and I've been quite involved in the community. And I care about this community like every, all each one of us up here care about their community. But you know, as you know, Foster City is master planned community. And we had a vision for the community and the vision for the most part has been realized. And it is time now for us to start, create a new vision, have a coordinated strategic plan for the city to move us to the next century, if you will. We need to have a plan for the next 50 years. Our city is highly dependent on property tax. I would like to be part of a team that will diversify the income of the city and move us forward for the next uh, next future. So I'm looking forward to serving on this council. Yeah. Marty, I want to put a little slightly different spin on it. All of them served on a Parks and Rec Commission or a Homeowners Association, but you, you're sort of an outsider to, uh, to the city government. Yes, I am. And so how did, that, how did that change? What prompted you to run? Well, as you said, I, I was a public works inspe inspector for the city for uh, almost 11 years. And as, as an employee there, I always thought that San Bruno just wasn't reaching its potential and seeing from, from how our streets were, were degrading, how, how our water rates were increasing, and, and it all came to a head when I found out I was going to be a father for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a very tough decision at that point to, to, to look at another job. I, I, I was provided an uh, opportunity to work for the current employer, Alameda County Water District, and I was looking to, forward to the opportunity to, to expand my career and, and look out for my family. So I made the, the, the decision to leave. Mm -hmm. And I realized that as I was leaving that, well, I could also be run for city council. Mm -hmm. And I did, but that was in 2013, mm -hmm. and I lost. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, it was a un unique to decide 
for me to, to actually try it to do it again because mm -hmm. it was a very it's hard knowing that you try very hard to do something and it didn't work out mm -hmm. but I didn't give up I uh, our city is over a hundred years old and I want to bring the the construction inspector side to our council so that they can rely and kind of help I can help them help everybody thank you Diane I think, I, I mean, I ran because I really feel I could make a difference. I was involved at the neighborhood level, and, um, you know, I'm sort of called to serve, and I really felt like I could make a difference. Uh, like Marty, I had a, a background in public works. I litigated a lot of public works projects early on in my career. And so public works is kind of my passion, and I feel that, and I know that a lot of us are facing within our cities that our infrastructure has really reached the end of its useful life. I'm very grateful to the folks in the last century that had the foresight to build the infrastructure that we currently enjoy. And I really want, same thing, our children to be able to look back at us and say at the turn of this century, gee, didn't we have the foresight to replace our sewers, to repair our roads? So it is a very local thing when you serve for city government. It is about potholes, and I care about potholes. And you will hear it from your neighbors if they hit that bump every day. They may follow the national debates, but real, what impacts them on a daily basis is whether they have a pothole on their street. And when I ran, I kind of came up with this slogan, I, I was determined to make sewers sexy. Like, <laughs> I wanted people to know that that's what we were about. And, and I think we are all facing infrastructure needs within our, our communities. And um, that's what I look forward to doing, is really having an impact, whether it's wastewater treatment plant, whether it's sewers, whether it's streets. That's what, that's what we do in local government. So I, I'm terribly excited about it, actually. You'll let you know, us know if you succeed in making sewer sexy. I shall. I shall. <laughs> Stay tuned. Doug. My answer is uh, pretty simple. Um, public service has been toward my career. Uh, I'm an urban planner, and so for the last 25 or so years, um, my job has been to help cities, help regions deal with growth, traffic, financial issues. Um, and for a, for a long time, I managed to stay on the sidelines and not get involved in civic politics. But um, Belmont today is at the proverbial crossroads. Um, and I thought, well, now is the right time to sort of step up my game, get off the sidelines, and get more involved in policymaking at the city level. So um, we, we've seen in the city what... Um, what one approach to governance has produced over the years, and um, I'd like to be part of sort of a new wave of thinking about what a small city like Belmont can do going forward. Shelley. It's always hard to be the last one, right, <laughs> on these questions. You know, as I think a lot of people know, Redwood City has undergone a tremendous amount of growth over the last just couple of years, really. And, um, and fundamentally, even if we sort of stopped everything, as some people have called for, Redwood City is going to be a different place in the next five years. And what I felt that I could bring was the council really needs to help lead our city through change. And having served as a school board member for the last 10 years under a time of tremendous change for public education, some very difficult times, uh, really focused on community outreach and engagement with our district, really changing the culture and tone of how we did things in Redwood City School District, I just wanted to be able to bring that experience to the council, help contribute in a way that I think could be positive to continue to make Redwood City great. I want my kids to be able to come back and live in Redwood City if if possible, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to. Well, they may have to launch whole new careers. Yeah. Um, no, so let awesome. me throw it open to, to all of you. Um, I, I know you ran on issues and priorities that you laid out, and many of them you, you just discussed, but have you found in the short time you've been in office the expectations are somewhat different than you thought they were? What are the expectations you're hearing about from, uh, from the public? Diane, you, let's start with you, since you mentioned potholes. Um, you know, that governs best, which governs uh, closest to the people, isn't it? I think it was Jefferson said that. But um, that's the idea, really, isn't it? That you're, um, that whatever is on somebody's mind that's really specific to them, they're going to bring them plop in your lap. Right. And, and one, one that comes to mind in particular is traffic. And, and we're all, you know, we're at the heart of the, what they call it, the, the technology corridor. So we're all dealing with both regionally and within our city. And everyone wants traffic stopped immediately. And the thing that I find is, 
Everything needs a study, Mark. Yes. Everything needs a study, and you need <laughs> consultants to study the problem. The public doesn't really, they don't care about the study. They just want traffic stopped on their street. So I would say that's one area where, where we're learning to find the balance between, you know, you don't want to delay it too long because people are very uncomfortable right now. So uh, if we can sort of shorten up the study period, <laughs> I think we might make our constituencies happier. Emily, how much of the job is, is explaining to people that the studies have to be done, that you can't just jump to a solution. Um, how much of your job is, is essentially being a go-between? Absolutely. Being an ambassador, I think. Yeah. It, well, it, 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 and it's, it's, it's a magnificent form of government, if you really think about it, right? The elected officials that sort of have a, you know, they're policy makers and they're, um, can't possibly be experts in everything. And uh, once you're sitting in this seat, you really understand and have a whole new level of respect for the professional staff that runs the city. It's such a complex organization. My city manager has a great saying, it's the tip of the iceberg, that's sort of the policy stuff too, but then there's a whole, uh, you know, just incredible um, efforts that go in to just keep a city running. Mm -hmm. So being an ambassador and under, having a glimpse of that behind the scenes of how complicated things are, whether it's to get a, a study done or to uh, try to get grade separation at a particular <laughs> intersection, which we're well versed in here with Broadway. Um, you know, it's it, it's complicated, but we are the front lines and we see the people in the grocery store and, and around town and we're responsible to them to help communicate that and help, I think, as both Shelley alluded to too, is bring people along and engage people as much as possible so that they begin to have the understanding yeah. um, of, of the reasons why. Who else has a comment on the expe unexpected expectations, maybe, is the way to put it. Shelley? You know, I think somebody pointed out to me the other day that uh, government is not allowed to fail. You know, we sort of, we live in this innovation era, right? And so it's all about iterating and failing. But if you're a local government, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so, and you are going to sometimes make decisions where you think it's the right thing to do, which is why you do the studies. Um, but it's things don't work, and you have to be able to go back and work with your community and relook at what are you, how are we going to change this? How are we going to move things a little bit? so that it effectively is um, serving your city. But ultimately the issue is, and I think Diane, you were just saying this a minute ago, it's about people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting in traffic, you don't care about a study, you just care about am I gonna get to work on time, am I gonna get my kids to school on time, am I, is somebody gonna rear end me? Um, but so the pace with which things move, which you know, coming from a school district I'm a little bit familiar with, is frustrating for the community. They, as you said, they just want things to change because their lives are being impacted on a daily basis. We're going to take a quick break. You'll all stick around, right? Yeah, sure. You stick around too. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Special Edition. I'm Mark Simon, surrounded by new city council members. Uh, I'm not going to introduce them again because we'll get to them all and you'll see their names as we go on. But we really want to get back to the question we were discussing, which is what are the expected, unexpected expectations? And uh, Doug, you wanted to say something. Uh, I think a, once, uh, a wise philosopher once said that unhappiness is um, the product of expectations not fulfilled, right? Um, I've had a lot of coffee sessions with people in my city, and so um, those sessions are inter interesting because I think there's an expectation from people in Belmont that uh, the city council can just wave a magic wand and things can change. Uh, and sometimes that can happen, but um, part of my job has been to explain to them that um, your issue is important, but there are also 17 other issues that are important. And so as ambassadors, I think we have to let folks know that we have to balance a bunch of interests sometimes are competing. In terms of expectations, the other thing I th think is interesting is I've tried to educate people about the black box that is sort of government. And I've told them, you really need to get more involved. Get yourself educated about what's going on at City Hall. A lot of people simply don't have the time to be involved. I think part of our job is to try to pull more people into a more inclusive process. Yeah. Marty, what about you? you? You sort of have the outsider perspective, insider perspective at the same time. You know, I, I, I just want to keep people interested. Because now that there's an election, I don't know what are you going to do, and it's kind of like, well, there's a process. Well, and there was a tendency for people to think, okay, I've voted, I've done my job, now you go fix exactly, everything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and 
one of the big things that, that is going on in, in San Bruno right now is that there's a hotel development. Mm -hmm. And it was quite controversial because at some certain point, it, it was disclosed that the, the city was considering giving them nearly $4 million in, in subsidies or assistance. And we're still waiting. Uh, we had a closed session about the, about the, uh, the deal and, and we're waiting. And, and the public's like, well, what's going on with that? And, and, and so a local uh, union, Local 2, uh, got involved and, and they are the people that uh, serve in the hotels and the restaurants and they, they want to have a union shop. And they brought 700 uh, postcards in mm -hmm. of, of trying to, to show that this, the community was supporting union wages. And we're up there and we couldn't talk about it. And we want to engage with, with, with our, our constituents, but we're not allowed to talk about it until it's process is through the negotiations which are in closed session. So we can't even tell anybody about what's going on in, in closed session. So it's really... You want to say something, but you can't. Legally, we cannot talk what, about what, what is, uh, happens in closed session. So it's, it's just getting people to understand that, the education um, of how things need to take their time and, and trying to get them there. Yes, yeah. yeah, along the same lines that Doug spoke about, it's people expect you to be waving that magic wand and make things happen. But as Marty mentioned, so we, some, uh, the public is not privy to some of the information that you know. And as you know, we're looking at the bigger picture. It's not just focused on one little thing. So how would that topic or subject that's important to the public, how does it fit in the overall scheme of the plan for the community? But I think what we've been doing and what I would be advocating for more of is community outreach. As much as we get our community involved, I think that will get us open that line of communication. And Foster City just recently, this past week, we started our first e-newsletter and we had also launched our app, Foster City Access, where citizens could reach out to uh, city officials for complaining about issues or catch, uh, keeping up with our meetings, our agendas, uh, planning commission. So getting the public involved, we're so fortunate to have quite a diverse community well-educated public, I think there's a great pool of information and talent that if we tap into that, with them working with us, we could overcome a lot of that misconception and we could bring a lot of fresh ideas. So I'm very excited. You know, I, I mentioned, oh, go ahead, Diane. Well, I was just gonna say, I think what we're hearing is democracy is not a spectator sport and we all are trying to get communities involved. One thing that San Mateo has embarked upon is a series of traffic forums and they're holding them, because our city is 100,000 people, so they're having two a month and holding them in specific neighborhoods throughout the city. I went to the first one, and they had over 100 people, broke them out into groups, working sessions. You know, which street corner do you hate the most, and what's happening with it? So engaging the public is always going to be a challenge for us. Um, it's one thing to complain, but it's another thing to get together and actually collectively, constructively try to work upon, you know, our individual problems. So it's a challenge for us. And that's the hard part, Shelley. <laughs> well, it's just, I think that's, it's a great point because... Um, the next step after complaining is what's your, what's a solution, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. And um, and there is lots to complain about. I mean, we do have lots of challenges that are brought on by for a lot of different reasons in this region, and I think we all, to a certain degree, have some similar challenges. Um, and so we hear a lot of the same things. So things things about housing, about traffic, about that the kinds of things that are have are the result of our economy, in part, um, in large part. But the complaining doesn't actually solve the problem. And so what I think we need the public to help us think about is, okay, so we know this is a, an issue, so what are we going to do about it? And it's not just, you guys come up with a good solution, you guys come up with a creative solution right. that nobody's thought about before because a lot of these issues are ongoing things. It's not new that people have had traffic problems over the years, right? It's not new that we've had a housing crisis. It ebbs and flows from time to time, but what that you, you it's a whole series of things that are going to help us address that challenge i, I mentioned at the, the top of the show that i described you know there's <clears throat> there's a certain amount of anger abroad in the body politic <clears throat> it's really evident at the presidential level um others have said that it's um a, a, there's a cynicism about government there's a skepticism about government uh did you run into that on the campaign trail and 
a lot of what you're talking about is is trying to attack that, you know, how, how do you balance what what is a complex problem with people who think, well, it's simple, just do X, and the reason you're not doing it is some hidden agenda that you just, you know, especially when you have to go into closed session. So who wants to di dive in on this one first? Uh, Emily. You know, it's an interesting... Um complex issue, but I think what, what at least I found at the local level is that people, um, I think, have some trust in their local officials in a way because we are so close to home. And I found, you know, it's a very grassroots process running. I'm sure all of us went through a similar process. There's, there's door knocking. I mean, I think I knocked on 2,000 doors in Burlingame myself, let alone the team. Um, you're meeting with people, and for the most part, they really appreciate, mm -hmm. for the most part, that you're out there mostly wanting to listen to mm -hmm. them, not exposed by viewpoint. It's really a, a listening process, internalizing, and I think that um, that helps us a little bit at the local level because we are so accessible. We need to be. They, they know our emails, our phone numbers. We meet for coffee and we're out there and um, you know we can address those issues on a local yeah. level in a very accessible way. Somebody else? Doug. Oh, Sam, go ahead. Well, you know, the most rewarding part of being on a local level uh, politics is you see the impact Mm -hmm. of the work you've done immediately and you see it yourself and you hear from <laughs> your constituents on, 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 on a daily basis. So yeah. we are interacting with our residents and with our businesses on a daily basis. So this is very rewarding. And speaking like Emily, knocking on doors, I was quite surprised. Uh, people are so welcoming. People were waiting for us to come in, knock on their doors and got invited to many houses to come in, have lunches, have dinners and so forth but people really wanted to come and talk to you. And they appreciate that you are running. I had several people who said, we're gonna vote for you just because you came out to our door. Mm -hmm. I mean, so people, for the most part, appreciate what we're doing and, <laughs> and, you know, they understand that we are taking time from our families, from our businesses, for the betterment of our cities. So uh, I, I think we are being appreciated yeah. and of course, it's an ongoing process. We have to keep improving. We have to keep, I think the key is really communicating with the public, keep them apprised to what's going on. On the other hand, you probably haven't had to cast a controversial vote yet, except maybe <laughs> the vote for mayor. In <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, well, the, and maybe that's a good example of what I'm talking about, because there's a, tent a temptation when you're cynical to think you're smart by saying, I know what's really going on. I know the deals that were made behind the scenes right. when maybe there weren't any. Right. So, so let's talk about that a little bit in terms of the, you know, what did you learn from the campaign that was of all, any use at all in, in terms of being involved in a situation where somebody's saying, well, I know what they're really doing there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right, Mark, and people do have a lot of expectations when you run. And when you're running, you're fresh and you're new and you haven't done anything that's going to potentially upset anybody. I think probably lots of people got this question when you were running is, well, what's the first thing you're going to do, yeah. right? Like, what's the first thing you're going to do? And one of the things I said in one forum was, I am not going to, you know, I individually cannot do anything. And I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. When you sit on a governing body like we do as a council, it takes a majority of your council to make anything happen. And so as an as an individual, you shouldn't be moving a particular project or idea or something like that without the support of the rest of the council. That, if that's happening, then something is really not working <laughs> properly in your city. Um, but that's also frustrating because we've had, I've already had people come up and testify, I voted for you, you said you were going to do this, I expect this to happen. Um, but again, I can only do it if I have the rest of my council. So a piece of it is, a really important piece of it is developing relationships with mm -hmm. your other council members, helping understand how they think, what are their issues, what do they know, within the Brown Act, of course. <laughs> um, and then being able to try and have that discussion publicly when controversial issues come up. We've had several already on our agenda in Redwood City over the last couple of weeks. So, um, so you dove right in. We dove right mm -hmm. in, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Doug, you had a thought? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, through the whole campaign, I learned probably two or three things. First, there's probably nothing more uncomfortable than deciding whether you're going to knock on someone's door at 645 on a Tuesday <laughs> night when you know they're having dinner. But I found what I think a lot of people found, which is people are extremely grateful that you took the time to, um, to talk to them. 
And um, I found that uh, a lot of folks felt that they wanted City, City Hall to do, do, do a better job in listening to them, which to me is a two-way street because it has to be a, a, a participatory uh, sport. If, um, if folks aren't going to get involved, keep educated about issues, then you're not getting that sort of feedback from the public. But then I also heard a, a different approach, which was, you know what, I just want City Hall to work. Just make it work. Um, and I said, well, you know, that's, that's our job, but it would be nice to get input from you throughout the process. process. So please stay involved. Um, otherwise, we don't really know what's important to you uh, in the process of governing. We're going to take a break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Special Edition. I'm Mark Simon. We're talking with new members of uh, Peninsula City Councils. And we were talking about the reality of the job versus not just the issue expectation, Diane, but they expect you to clean up City Hall. I mean, when Schwarzenegger ran for government, he was going to root out waste, fraud, and corruption like there was a department of waste, fraud, and corruption he could just <laughs> cut out of the budget. And, of course, he never quite got around to it. Yeah. Um, and, and so how do you deal with the cynicism, the expectation that you're going to disappoint the public, that we really know what's going on behind right. the scenes? Well, I think it's about disseminating information, so pushing information out, and also garnering information and bringing it in. And, and I think, like many of us have said, people want to be heard. You may not be able to solve every problem. And, and I also think managing expectations is part and parcel of that is admitting you may not be able to solve every problem. Or, like, like Doug said, there are competing priorities. So... I know that you might not want that stop sign on your street, but guess what? It's a really dangerous intersection for the kids that are crossing that street. So you, you do have to manage competing interests. You're probably going to disappoint somebody somewhere along the line, but you try to do, you know, what it, what's in your heart that you feel is best. But I think, and I also think it's a generational thing, too. I feel that seniors are much more engaged than my contemporaries. And I would really like to see my contemporaries, they were engaged during the campaign, and I really, that was important to me, to get parents from my kids' school involved in the campaign. But my goal is to keep them involved and to keep them thinking that sewers are sexy or, you know, whatever it may be. It's because it is about our own children's tomorrow. So I'm hopeful that I can, because I find seniors are very generous with their time, very generous with their experiences, and, and op very open-minded to what government can and can't do. But I feel our contemporaries, they're busy with their lives. The goal is to keep them involved. What have you learned being on the council that you didn't expect? I mean, we were, we were chatting before about, you know, there was a, a longtime city manager of Burlingame, Jim Nantel, said whenever he had a new council member who came in with 27 great ideas, <laughs> the first thing he says, do you have three votes? <laughs> That's um, right. And, and, of course, knowing that you actually can't go get three votes until you present it in public, which tended to take a little wind out of your sails. Have you had the wind taken out of your sails a little bit so far? Or is, and, yeah, is, it's about counting. It's simply yeah. about counting. You know, do you have the votes? Can you convince? In my case, it's it's two others. Right. Um, so um, we're we're finding our way on that one. Yeah. yeah. Anything surprised you? You know, I, the thing I was actually surprised about is the volume of email, and that sounds kind of silly, but um, the things that people email their council about um, that really is not about at least in Redwood City. It's not necessarily about something you can do as a city or an issue they have with the city, but all kinds of bigger issues. Um, that's one piece. But then, really, people do send us a lot. And I think Redwood City is in a unique position probably because of the rate of development and how much has changed in our city. Uh, but we are constantly getting um, many, many, many emails each day. And I guess I just didn't sort of realize that that was going to be the case. So I'm trying to get back to everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Other surprises? Marty. Um, <clears throat> yes, of course. Uh, um, San, San Bruno owns its own uh, cable company. And yeah, we're working on that here at Penn <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, there is a large uh, homeowner association of condos, um, Shelter Creek, and they were approached by a competitor that wanted to come in and bring fiber to that complex. 
And this is a time where government can work fast, where we responded, we talked to our, to our crews about how quickly could you get fiber to that area. And we voted on it, and I was able to, to look at it a little differently, saying, well, we can anticipate that coming to the next, they call it low fruit, right? right. Where the next uh, AT&T or Verizon or whomever is gonna look at another big complex. So I asked our council, hey, when we put the bid out, let's get an alternate bid to where we can also look at these other two locations in our city so that we could compare the prices and maybe go for a bigger project or we can scale it back depending on what the prices are. So yeah. things, things come up unexpectedly and, and then, then again, and it goes fast or it goes really slow. So, <laughs> so I, was, I was surprised about that dynamic of, uh -huh. of that range. Yeah. Emily. Um, surprises on the job. I, we alluded a little to it before, um, how complicated it is running a city. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, like Diane, I have a bit of a passion for infrastructure. I talked a lot about it during the campaign. But my favorite day on the job so far was getting a four-hour tour of Burling Games water and sewer infrastructure mm -hmm. with the magnificent did, staff. Did you find that they were sexy to be in? I wouldn't say they were sexy, but it was fascinating. How many times have I ridden my bike by places in Burlingame, mm -hmm. and little did I know there's underground reservoirs and there's pump stations that, you know, in an emergency, there's redundancy. So water can get to homes up to the top of the hill by skyline. And then, you know, when the rains hit, how the storm drains work. And just seeing that firsthand, you understand how that's the most basic thing we do at a city level is deliver quality city services and in our infrastructure and how much money that costs and expertise and um, what a priority it is. And it was, it was very insightful. So mm -hmm. I say that was a surprise I expected, but I didn't quite expect it to be that surprised. Yeah. Anybody else? The one thing that surprised me is um, how the Brown Act affects how we all act. I mean, <laughs> if there was an issue before the seven of us. The Brown Act is, for those who don't know, is right. the public, public Meetings Act where virtually everything you do, unless it involves litigation or property purchase, has to be done in public. And as a council, you can't speak to more than, less than a majority, I should say, of your council outside of the chambers, outside right. of the public eye. So, I mean, it's sort of unnatural in a way, because if there was an issue that the seven of us had to deal with, we'd just start talking, right? But the way the Brown Act works, like you said, you really can't have those conversations offline. So for most of us that have a city council of five, you can only talk to one other person about a particular issue. So a common intro to any conversation is, hey, Emily, have you talked to anybody else about this particular issue? And it's good for the public, it's good for transparency, but it's a little counterintuitive. So that's been interesting to see. The other thing I've noticed is that you really do have to have a good relationship with your city manager and city mm -hmm. staff. Uh, because you can't talk to the rest of the council, you do have to educate yourself. And that often means having a, a close relationship with your city manager. Mm -hmm. Sam, anything? I think the most surprising for me has been so far the amount of reading <laughs> we have to do. Yeah. We just had the staff report over 600 pages that we went through. And uh, the amount of time that needs to be dedicated to being a council member. The request from the public to meet with you and you have to honor those requests because this is who you're representing. And it really takes a lot of time. That was not, I did not expect the amount of time needed. I expected 25 hours, maybe a week. This is a full-time job. But you know, on the good side, on the good side, we just had our council retreat. We spent a whole day with our team all five of us with our city staff. To your point, you have to have a good relationship with your city manager. And I was so surprised that we worked so harmoniously together. Our council members, with respect, each one of us got heard. And the, the staff, the executive team, all of them were prepared. They make our lives so much easier. So when we sit down on that city council meeting and we speak and we know what we're talking about, just think about the amount of work that the city staff has done behind the scenes. I'm complaining about reading 600 pages. It took me so many hours, but how many hours it had taken them to prepare that for us to make us look bright and look as make sharp. So I appreciate that part. But I'm, you know, really that retreat told me that we have a team of champions of good policy and governance. So I'm very excited to yeah. continue this good work. Well, that gets to another topic area, which is the cost of running 
um, on a personal level, I mean, many of you have young children or younger children. Um, what, what is the, following up on what Sam said, what, it, what is it costing you personally uh, to do something that uh, people expect you to be available whenever they decide they want to talk to their council member? I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, we make it work in our family. So mm. I, I, it, because um, it keeps me fulfilled. I think it sets a good example for our child. And um, I've got a really supportive husband who, who knows that um, this is important work. And it's, you know, we live our lives um, doing a lot of things for ourselves. And so giving back, whether it's, it's through any kind of public mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. I think it sets a good example. So yes, you pay a price. Sometimes I don't want to go to a meeting at seven o'clock at night. I'm tired or whatever. But um, you know, you come back, you're engaged. You feel like you might have made a difference. So on that score, I think the rewards sort of pay pay off for the for the sacrifices that we make with respect to our family. But you, you got to have the support at home. There's no question. But it does take you away from your family. It often can take you away from your job as well. Which, mm -hmm. Like you, right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, th but this is really quality time. Uh, um, I mean, does it does it hurt? Does it hurt? I guess is the question. Is it, is it a hard balance to find? It is a hard balance, like like anything. When you're making choices and you're trying to figure out where do I put my energy on any given day, um, certainly. And I think m many of us have full time jobs and families, and so making sure that you can provide the right amount of attention to your duties as a council member to do all the reading, to make right. sure that you do understand the issues when you get up on the dais and you're having that discussion with your fellow council members. Um, and you know, for sure, I'll say, I'll, for myself, having served on the school board, this is pretty much what my kids have grown up with. <laughs> they kind of go like, oh, you're, you're home? Okay, <laughs> that's weird, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> now I'm gone on Monday nights instead of Wednesday nights, but, um, but it is a cost to your family. I mean, it certainly is, and they, to a certain extent, are a little bit in the public eye, sort of depending on um, you know, the level of visibility that you have as a council member. And, um, and the, for my kids, my boys are in high school, my daughter's now in college, they have had to sort of... Um, <laughs> They're at an age where they don't want to be seen in public with you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. But, I mean, it is. They have sort of had to be much more independent than a lot of their um, friends. And I think that's probably true for those of you with younger kids as well. What about those, Marty? It's a sacrifice that I knew going into it that, that I was willing to, to, to pay. Yeah. Well, what do you do, though, when your kid says, Dad, you're never around anymore? He hasn't said that yet. He, he asked, um, are you going to a meeting? <laughs> and I said, yes. And by the way, he thinks he's also the vice mayor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's only three and a half, and, and so he, he's okay with it. He, um, I'm, it probably affects me more than it does him. And, and, um, but it's just hard it, to leave. It's huh? all about what we do now will affect his future in our city yeah. Yeah. And, and for exactly. all of our cities. So it's, it's worth it. We're going we're gonna to make a big difference in San Bruno. We're going to take another break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Special Edition. I'm Mark Simon. As we continue this next segment, you may notice that Emily Beach has left. She didn't storm off. She had another <laughs> commitment that she had to get to. Not that these people don't have busy lives themselves. It just... It's a commitment she made that uh, she felt honor-bound to keep. We were making up some stories about, well, we won't get into that. <laughs> Diane, you were talking and speaking of stories about some of the episodes you've had with trying to find a way to juggle a, oh, new, yes. uh, a new pattern to your life. That's right. Well, you know, he, my husband needed a little training, but I think he's okay. There was a spilled water bottle in the backpack that... I thought it was going to bring down the house. The textbooks got wet. Our daughter was upset. But all has been rectified, I'm here to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> on to city matters. <laughs> was it important uh, th that your family sign on to you running? And like a lot of the members of the public, did they understand what they were getting into yeah. when this yeah. got started? Uh, absolutely. When I w decided to run, the first question I was asked by my team is your wife signed on on this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to make sure your wife is signed on. So we did have that discussion. And we did say this is a commitment. But this is a commitment for the community from all of us and to leave a better community for our children and grandchildren. So the price was worth it for my wife decided. And I'm so fortunate that I work in the city. So I do get to see my children right after school when they 
come back at 3.30, 4 o'clock before we go to the meetings and so forth. So that's fortunate that I would be able to juggle between those. But uh, and no you question. you own your own business. That probably helps I own my too. own business, a yeah. local business in Foster City. So I'm two minutes away from home. Yeah. My kids stop by. I could go back to home and do that. So I'm fortunate in that sense. But it is really a, a commitment from the whole family. Mm -hmm. So even the kids that will take time from me being there in the evening when the meetings. But I think they all understand. Again, communication is a key. Like we communicate with our constituents, communicating with the family, communicating with the kids as to what is the reward in the long term will drive it home and my kids now at an age where they get it and uh, this is to me it was important to run and get them involved in the process so when I was campaigning it was family campaigning I got my wife involved I got my kids involved so they got the rewards along with me when we were running and the experience and learning from it so yeah. that's great I think I saw your kids with some campaign t-shirts on at one point homemade t-shirts yeah mm -hmm. you know uh, it's interesting because every one of us had a conversation with our spouses or our families where we said, well, I'm thinking about running, really, you know? And um, for me, what I found was interesting was that um, my kids are at an age where, you know, they don't care about hanging around dad as much, so that <laughs> helps. Um, but um, I told them that, you know, it's going to be at least two meetings a month. And I found that it's far from it. It's, mm. it's many more meetings than that, right? <laughs> um, and so to make this work, I will have failed if um, I don't educate my kids about civic issues. So I do try to talk to them about sexy sewers and, and roadway con congestion. And I found that they're actually sort of fired up about those kinds of things. Yeah. So That's right. if you make it more of an inclusive process mm -hmm. where they're learning as you're learning too, um, then it's not so bad that dad's away on a Tuesday night. Um, and that's been eye-opening for me. Yeah. It's sort of like the, what you learned in the campaign in microcosm. It's like, yeah, so it's well, like your own focus group. It <laughs> is. Well, and, and I think, you know, well, for me, because I have high schoolers, they actually have a lot of ideas mm -hmm. about <clears throat> what should happen in the city. And I'm happy that they're actually thinking about it. And I think they have, they have to think about it because I come home and I talk about it or they <laughs> hear, you know, what's going on. And, um, and so I think for, for my family, I think my kids will be much more engaged citizens. My daughter was able to vote for the first time in this mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. So she was super excited to be able to vote for me. And, and that was, pr it's pretty cool to be yeah. able to, to have those experiences together as a family. So I agree there is a trade off, but you're right, there are also some pretty big rewards. Let me ask each of you, g give as quick an answer as you can. I'll go around from Shelley to Sam. Mm -hmm. um, what's the number one issue in your city? Uh, the rate of development. Yeah. Doug? Financing all of the deferred maintenance we have on our storm drains and sewers. Yeah. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah, rebuilding our infrastructure. Yeah. Development and traffic. Okay. These are local issues. But many cases, there you know none of these cities exist in a vacuum. As everybody everybody thinks Belmont's real different from San Carlos. Most people don't know when they're in one town or another. Uh, not to pick on either one of those towns. You can really tell when you're in San Bruno, though. Um, I grew up in San Bruno, so I have okay. a little bias about San Bruno. But in any case, um, how do you how do you do that? How do you how do you solve development? How do you solve infrastructure? Because it's all connected. Mm -hmm. and, and so how much are you finding that these issues have regional implications and that, you know, that's a whole new level of engagement that you maybe didn't think about or knew about but still have to tackle? Well, I, I think we've had an opportunity to build some collegiality among council members and especially us new folks. Mm -hmm. But, there, you know, with CCAG at the county level and um, the MTC, you get the SAMTRANS, there are these county boards that city... Um, council members are able to serve on. So that does give us a real opportunity to work in a regional manner. And so when we have the opportunity to, to meet as colleagues and then we sit on those boards, the county works pretty well. Um, the, the biggest thing, of course, is this Peninsula Clean Energy Authority that's being enacted where we'll be getting our energy, presumably, um, 
from PCE, that's been a real exciting thing, and we're coming in just at the beginning of it, so it, it's been it's been a real neat thing, definitely. Yeah. But as an example, Doug and Shelley, you both have pretty good. Doug in Belmont, they're talking about creating a downtown in essence that wasn't there before, which certainly would have traffic implications for cities on either side. Redwood City, that's one of the standing complaints about Redwood City is yeah. you've done all this development, which has its own impact on the neighboring community. So how much do you have to take that into account, Doug? Building a, a downtown is the one thing that almost universally people told me was important. And I said, you understand, there are trade-offs. You're going to get a little more traffic, uh, but on the flip side, you're going to get more tax revenue so we can start to fix some of our crumbling sewers and such. Um, in the end, um, the devil's in the details. We just have to figure out how to find the sweet spot where you build enough without building too much. You, you manage traffic without stifling the opportunity for economic development. But do you have an obligation to concern yourself with what San Carlos or San Mateo may think about what you're doing? Or is it, is it really a truly a parochial issue? Um, for us, our downtown, I don't think is going to threaten the economic vitality of Laurel Street or downtown San Mateo. So I think our modest idea of a downtown in this case can be done certainly with consultation from our neighboring cities, but it, that, that really is a super local issue for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shelley, a little different in Redwood City where everybody thinks something about what's <laughs> happening in Redwood City. True. And, and it certainly, they could, they'd be justified, I think, in saying that it's had some regional impacts. Yeah, I think it absolutely has had regional impact. If you look at the rate of new businesses coming into Redwood City and what that's meant for commuters, both on Caltrain and on our roads, um, it's it is significant. There's no doubt about it. And so, and I think Diane's point is great about the opportunity for us to serve on some of these regional boards. It's why it's important to both make um, have good relationships on your own council, but across the different cities, mm -hmm. so you can pick up the phone and say, "Hey, you know, we're discussing this. It's on our agenda. Do you guys think that's going to have any impact on you?" You have to pay attention to your city. But because we are a series of 20 small cities in San Mateo County and then you know, south into Santa Clara uh, County, we have to consider how we're all gonna work together. In Redwood City, we've just signed a contract to do a plan for the El Camino. Well, the El Camino doesn't start and stop, of course, in Redwood City, right? We all have that. And so, so what is that gonna look like and how is that going to um, mesh with what's hap what the plans are up and down the peninsula makes a difference for people's quality of life in, in each of our cities. Yeah. Sam, in your case, it's almost the flip side of the problem, which is the traffic in Foster City, in and out on 92 and Hillsdale, is horrendous because of the region, not because of anything Foster City's done or not done, although that was one of the key ca campaign issues was, should we build more housing when we've got such a horrendous traffic mm -hmm. problem? Right. So how do you approach the regional problem from a local perspective. You're absolutely correct, Mark. I mean, the way I look at it, it's really more than what a Redwood City would do or more than what Belmont would do. It's really what we're dealing with is a byproduct of a great economy that creating so many jobs and we don't have enough housing. So the dilemma, as you mentioned, is can we build enough housing to eliminate the traffic or to lessen the traffic? And unfortunately, in the peninsula, we could only so do much in housing. Uh, we try in our best, as our, our neighboring communities are trying to do. The Grand Boulevard is one of those uh, projects that will tackle some of that issue. But the reality of the matter is that in the region, we have created over 170,000 jobs with only 8,000 housing units added in the mm -hmm. same period of time. So that imbalance is creating that traffic. So we are being challenged in Foster City, as you mentioned, because a lot of attention is being spent on the 101 south and north improvement and not much being uh, spent on the east and west commute, the 92. So we need to start, I mean, in Foster City, we're trying to push on having some attention and some money spent on the 92 corridor, and that affects San Mateo as well. They are dealing with the same, same issue. So if we improve the 101 so drastically and we don't take care of the 92, all that's still gonna funnel to the 101 and create the problems and issues. So a regional collaboration, absolutely important. San Mateo is known for San Mateo County with the Board of Supervisors. It's known for its collaboration between the cities. And this is something we could build on, all of us here. Oh, sorry. The electri electrification of Caltrain may make a difference in funding for grade separations that may 
yeah. impact that will help our east-west quite a bit. But you're right, we're going to have to work together, our cities, yeah. on that. No question. But I think the other issue, and you alluded to it, is the real need for housing and not just it's market rate housing, there. but also affordable housing. Right. And that's yeah. actually where Emily went, is to a forum on affordable housing. and. Um, how we are all going to work together to address the need for affordable housing is going to be really critical Absolutely. to the future of our county. We're running low. We're almost at the end of the, this ordeal for you. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you one more round real quick. Uh, a quick answer. Are you enjoying this? Yeah. Is it, what are, you, are you having fun? I love it. Um, the, the challenge is housing to me, and it's a tough issue, but uh, I love talking about how we're going to collectively try to solve this issue. Diane? Toughest job you'll ever have. No, but no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's tremendously rewarding. The rewards are worth the sacrifice yeah. in all regards. Marty? I absolutely agree. Yeah. Sam? It's been a great experience, and I wouldn't trade it. Well, it's been a great experience having all of you here. Thank you. Thank you to Emily Beach in Absentia. And thank you for joining us for watching Special Edition. We'll see you again soon.